and so I have to apologize to you. I have been accidentally neglecting a portion of each of these books that uh, has, it's come to my attention is quite important. Um, Mr. Lemony Snicket has been trying to tell us things that I've been ignoring because it was in the back of the book and I, I didn't realize how important it was until I actually read it uh, for the first time the other day. And I thought, you know what, I, I probably should go back through all of them and read them these little things because of course we've heard of Beatrice and we know that uh, every once in a while the author breaks that fourth wall and, and talks to us directly. So, and that's, that's my favorite part, but I hope you like it too. I love it when books do that. But um, he's been trying to tell us more things and I just didn't realize that he was. So um, if you would like to go directly to chapter 11, um, you might want to fast forward probably about 10 minutes. Hopefully it won't take me that long, but about 10 minutes. But this is, this is going to be really good stuff. You might want to hear it. If you're, list, if you're going to be following the whole series. All right. So first of all, in book one, the bad beginning, if you remember way back when we started book one, um, he dedicated it, dedicated the book to Beatrice, but he wrote to Beatrice, darling, dearest, dead. So that was right away. Uh, I should have pointed that out. And maybe I did. I don't remember. It's been a while. But uh, in the back, we have this verse, which is um, a note about the author, Lemony Snicket, which <laughs> that's, you know, not actually his name. Um, but it says, was born in a small town where the inhabitants were suspicious and prone to riot. He now lives in the city. During his spare time, he gathers evidence and is considered something of an expert by leading authorities, these are his first books for, for Harp. Oh goodness, I can't speak for Harper Collins. And then down below it says Brett Helquist was born in Ganado, Arizona, grew up in Orem, Utah, and now lives in New York City. He earned a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Brigham Young University and has been illustrating ever since. His art has appeared in many publications, including Cricket Magazine and the New York Times. Cricket Magazine. Hmm. Not familiar. Uh, but we can only assume, of course, that uh, Brett Link, Hen Helquist, goodness gracious, um, and Lemony Snicket are the same person. But to my kind editor, he writes in the back, I am writing to you from the London branch of the Herpetological Society, where I am trying to find out what happened to the reptile collection of Dr. Montgomery Montgomery. Following the tragic events that occurred while the bottle orphans were in his care, an associate of mine will place a small waterproof box in the phone booth of the Electra Hotel at 11 p.m. next Tuesday. Please retrieve it before midnight to avoid it falling into the wrong hands. In the box, you will find my description of these terrible events entitled The Reptile Room, as well as a map of Lousy Lane a copy of the film Zombies in the Snow and Dr. Montgomery's Recipe for Coconut Cream Pie. Awesome. I have also managed to track down one of the few photographs of Dr. <laughs> Lucafont in order to help Mr. Le that, let's do that again, Mr. Helquist with his illustrations. Remember, you are my last hope for that, <laughs> that the tales of the bottler orphans can finally be told to the general public. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. All right, so that's all the extra we have there. But in book number two, let's first see who he dedicates it to. For Beatrice, my love for you shall live forever. You, however, did not. Oh my gosh. Okay. <sighs> all right, let's see. Okay, so this part is exactly the same. I don't need to read that again. But to my kind editor, I'm writing to you from the shores of Lake Lacrimos, where I'm excited the remains of Aunt Josephine's house, sorry, examining the remains of Aunt Josephine's house in order to completely understand everything that happened when the bottler orphans found themselves here. Please go to the Cafe, Cafe Kafka, love it, 
at 4 p.m. next Wednesday and order a pot of jasmine tea from the tallest waiter on duty. Unless my enemies have succeeded, he will bring you a large envelope instead. Inside the envelope, you'll find my description of these horrific events entitled The Wide Window. As well as a sketch of Curdle Cave, a small bag of shattered glass, and the menu for the Anxious Clown Restaurant, there will also be a test tube containing one lacrimose leech so that Mr. Hellquist can draw an accurate illustration under no circumstances, and it's all in bold. Should this test tube be opened, remember, you are my last hope that the tales of the bottler orphans can finally be told to the general public. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Okay, let's see what you have for number three. All right, dedication. For Beatrice, I would much prefer it if you were alive and well. Oh, why didn't I read these before? Just skip things. <sighs> Super fun things, it seems. Born before you were in, like, eight to die as well. Okay, so this one's different. Lemony Snicket was born before you were and is likely to die before you as well. A studied expert in <laughs> rhetorical analysis, Mr. Snicket has spent the last several eras researching the travails of the Baudelaire orphans. He finds are being his, his findings are being published seriously by HarperCollins. Brett Hellquist was born in Granada, Arizona, grew up in uh, uh, art, appeared in many publications, including Craig and Mary. No, that's the same. Okay. To my, to my kind editor, I am writing to you from the Paltryville Town Hall, where I have convinced the mayor to allow me inside the I-shaped office of Dr. Orwell in order to further investigate what happened to the Baudelaire orphans while they were living in the area. Next Friday, a black jeep will be in the northwest corner of the parking lot of the Orion Observatory. Break into it. In the glove compartment, you shall find my description of this frightening chapter in the Baudelaire's lives, entitled The Miserable Mill, as well as some information on hypnosis, a surgical mask, and 68 sticks of gum. I have also included the blueprint of the pitcher, the pitcher machine, which I believe Mr. Helquist will find useful for his illustrations. Remember, you are my last hope that the tales of the bottle of orphans can finally be told to the general public. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Okay, that's the end of that. All right, so you know what? I better go on to chapter 11, and then I'll, I'll continue with these. So there's, there's much more, and it's probably going to take more than 10 minutes, and we're already eight minutes in. So I will do chapter 11, which is over here. I should have all my things together. I don't, and I'm sorry. It's the holidays. It's cold outside for Arizona, which is like 70 degrees, but still, it's cold to me. <laughs> Shivering over here. All right, chapter 11. Inside these letters, the I will see nearby our friends and BFD. Ooh. Oh, it's a couplet. Okay. Chapter 11. Inside these letters, the I will see nearby are your friends and VFD. Isn't it marvelous, Klaus said with a grin, and his sister read the fourth couplet. Isn't it absolutely superlative? Never on, Sonny said, which meant it's more confusing than superlative. We still don't know where the quagmires are. Yes, we do, Klaus said, taking the other couplet out of his pocket. Hmm. Think about all four poems in order, and you'll see what I mean. For sapphires we are held in here, only you can end our fear. Until dawn comes, we cannot speak, no words can come from this sad beak. The first thing you read contains the clue, an initial way to speak to you. Inside these letters, the I will see, nearby are your friends and BFD. I think you're much better at analyze, uh, analyzing poetry than I am, Violet said, and Sonny nodded in agreement. This poem doesn't make it any clearer. But you're the one who first suggested the solution, Klaus said. When we received the third poem, you thought that that initial meant initials like BFD. But you said that it probably meant first, Violet said. The poems are the first way the quagmires can speak to us from where they are hidden. I was wrong, Klaus admitted. I've never been so happy to be wrong in my life as the door meant initials all along. 
I didn't realize it until I read the part that said, inside these letters, the eye will see she's hiding the location inside the poem. Like Aunt Josephine hid her location inside her note, remember? Of course I remember, Violet said, but I still don't understand. The first thing you read contains the clue, Klaus recited. We thought that Isidore meant the first poem, but she meant the first letter. Oh. She couldn't tell us directly where she and her brother were hidden in case someone else got the poem from the clause before we did. So she had to use a sort, a sort of code. If we look at the first letter of each line and we can use, and we can see the triplet's location. For sapphires, we are held in here. That's F, Violet said. Only you can end our fear. That's O. Until dawn comes, we cannot speak, Klaus said. That's U. No words can come from that this sad beak. That's N. The first letter you, re you read contains the clue T, Violet said excitedly, an initial way to speak to you, A. I, N, Sunny cried triumphantly, and the three bottlers cried out the solution together. The fountain, foul fountain, Klaus said. The quagmires are right outside that window. But how can they be in the fountain, Violet asked. And how could Isadora give her poems to the BFT crows? We'll answer, we'll answer that question, those questions, Klaus replied, as soon as we get out of this jail. We'd better get back to the mortar dissolver before Detective Dump Dupin comes back, along with a whole town of people who want to burn us at the stake. That's to, thanks to mob psychology, Violet said with a shudder. Sunny crawled over to the loaf of bread and placed her tiny head against the wall. Mush, she cried, which meant something like, the mortar is almost dissolved, just a little bit longer. Violet took the ribbon out of her hair and then recited it which was something she did when she needed to rethink a word which her, which here means think even harder about the bottle air orphans the bottle air orphans terrible situation <sighs> i'm not sure we have e have ever have even a little bit longer she said looking up the looking out the window okay <sighs> How bright the sunlight is. The morning must be almost over. Then we should hurry, Klaus said. No, Violet corrected. We should rethink. And I've been rethinking this bench. We can use it in another way besides as a ramp. We can use it as a battering ram. Poems? Sunny asked. A battering ram is a large piece of wood or metal used to break down doors or walls, Violet explained. Military inventors used it in the medieval times to break into walled cities, and we're going to use it now to break out of jail. Violet picked up the bench so it was resting on her shoulders. The bench should be pointing as evenly as possible, she said. Sonny, get on Klaus's shoulders. If the two of you hold the other end together, I think this battering ram will work. Klaus and Sonny scrambled into, into position. Violet had suggested, and in a moment, the siblings were ready to operate Violet's latest invention. The two bottler sisters had a firm hold on the wood, and Klaus had a firm hold on Sunny, so she wouldn't fall to the floor of the deluxe cell as, as they battered. Now, Violet said, let's step back as far as we can, and at the count of three, run quickly towards the wall. Aim the battering ram for the spot where the mortar dissolver was working. Ready? One, two, three. Thunk! The bottlers ran forward and smacked the bench against the wall as hard as they could. The battering ram made a noise so loud that it felt as if the entire gel would collapse, but they left only a small dent in, the, in a few of the bricks, as if the wall had been bruised slightly. Again! Violet commanded. One, two, three. Thunk! Outside, the children could hear a few crows fluttering wildly, frightened by the noise. A few more bricks were bruised, and one had a long crack down the middle. It's working, Klaus cried. The battering ram is working. One, two, minga! Sunny shrieked, and the children smacked the battering ram against the, the wall again. Ow! Klaus cried and stumbled a little bit, almost dumping his baby, dropping his baby sister. A brick fell on my toe. Hooray, Violet cried. I mean, sorry about your toe, Klaus. But if bricks are falling in, it means the wall is definitely weakening. 
Let's put down the battering ram and get a better look. We don't need a better look, Klaus said. We'll know if it's working when we see foul fountain. One, two, three, thunk! The bottlers heard the sound of more pieces of brick hitting the filthy floor of the deluxe cell. But they also heard another sound, a familiar one. It began with a faint rustling and then grew and grew, grew until it sounded like a million pages were being flipped. It was the sound of the VFD crows flying in circles before departing for their afternoon roost. And it meant that the children were running out of time. Pearl! Sunny, Sunny cried desperately. And then, as loudly as she could, one, two, Minga! At the count of Minga, which of course meant something along the lines of three, the children raced toward the wall of the deluxe cell and smacked their battering ram against the bricks with the mightiest thunk, yet a noise that was accompanied by an enormous cracking sound as the invention snapped into. Violet staggered in one direction and Klaus and Sunny staggered in another as each separate half made them lose, lose their balance and the huge cloud of dust sprang from the point where the battering ram had hit the wall. A huge cloud of dust is not a beautiful thing to look at. Very few painters have done portraits of huge clouds of dust or included them in their landscapes or still lifes. Film director, directors rarely choose huge clouds of dust to play the lead roles of romantic comedies. And as far as my research has shown, a huge cloud of dust has never placed higher than 25th in a beauty pageant. Nevertheless, as the bottle or orphan stumbled around the cell, dropping each half of the battering ram and listening to the sound of the crows flying in circles outside, they stared at the huge cloud of dust as if it were a thing of great beauty because this particular huge dust cloud was made of pieces of brick and mortar and other building materials that are needed to build a wall. And the bottlers knew that they were seeing it before because Violet's invention had worked. As the huge cloud of dust settled on the cell floor, making it even dirtier, the children gazed around them with a big, with big dusty grins on their face because they saw an additional beautiful sight, a big gaping hole in the wall of the deluxe cell, perfect for a speedy escape. We did it, Violet said, and stepped through the hole in the cell into the courtyard. She looked up at the sky just in time to see the last few crows departing for the downtown district. We escaped. Klaus, still holding Sonny on his shoulders, paused to wipe the dust off his glasses before stepping out of the cell and walking past Violet to Foul Fountain. We're not out of the woods yet, he said, using a phrase which here means there's still plenty of trouble on the horizon. He looked up at the sky and pointed to the distant blur of the departing crows. The crows are heading downtown for, this af for their afternoon roost. The townspeople should arrive any minute now. But how can we get the quagmires out, out any minute now? Wait, let's try that again. But how can we get the quagmires out any minute now? Violet asked. Walk! Sunny cried from Klaus's shoulders. She meant something like, the fountain looks as solid as can be. And her siblings nodded in disappointed agreement. Foul fountain looked as impenetrable, a word which here means impossible to break into, and rescue kidnap triplets as it did ugly. The metal crow sat and spat water all over itself as if the idea of the bottlers rescuing the quagmires made it sick to its stomach. Duncan and Isadora must be trapped inside of the fountain, Klaus said. Perhaps there's a mechanism someplace that opens up a secret entrance. But we cleaned every inch of this fountain for, for afternoon chores, Violet said. We would have noticed a secret mechanism while we were scrubbing all those car carved feathers. Juju, Sunny said, which meant something like, surely Isadora has given us a hint about how, one more time. Sunny said, which meant something like, surely Isadora has given us a hint about how to rescue her. Klaus put down his baby sister and took the four scraps of paper out of his pocket. It's time to rethink again, he said, spreading out the couplets on the ground. We need to examine these poems as closely as we can. There must be another clue about getting into the fountain. For sapphires, we are held in here. Only you can end our fear. Until dawn comes, we cannot speak. No words can come from this sad beak. The first thing you read contained the clue, an initial way to speak to you. Inside these letters, the eye will see 
nearby are your friends and VFD. This sad beak, Violet ex exclaimed, we jumped to the conclusion that she meant the VFD's crows, but maybe she meant foul fountain. Oh. The water comes out of the crow's beak, so there must be a hole there. We'd better climb up and see, Klaus said. Here, Sonny, get on my shoulders again, and then I'll get on, Bi on Violet's shoulders. We're going to have to be very tall to reach all the way up there. Violet nodded and knelt at the base of the fountain. Klaus put, put Sonny back on his shoulders and then got on, on the shoulders of his older sister. And then carefully, carefully, Violet stood up. So all three bottlers were balancing on the top of one another like a troop of acrobats. Of acrobats. The children had seen once when their parents had taken them to the circus. The key difference, however, is that acrobats rehearse their routines over and over in rooms with safety nets and plenty of cushions so that when they make a mistake, they will not injure themselves. But the bottle and orphans had no time to rehearse or to find cushions to lay out on BFD's streets. <laughs> As a result, the bottler's balance balancing act was a wobbly one. Violet wobbled from holding up both her siblings, and Klaus wobbled from standing on his wobbling sister, and poor Sunny was wobbling so much that she was just barely able to sit up on Klaus's shoulders and peer into the beak of the gargling metal crow. Violet looked down at the streets to watch for any arriving townspeople, and Klaus gazed down at the ground where his door's poems were still spread out. What do you see, Sonny? asked Violet, who was spotted who had spotted a few very distant figures walking quickly towards the fountain. She's Sonny called down. Klaus, the beak isn't big enough to get inside the fountain. Violet said desperately, the streets of the town appear to be shaking up under up and down as she wobbled more and more. What can we do? Inside these letters, the eye will see. Klaus muttered to himself, as he often did when he was thinking hard about something he was reading. It took all of his concentration to read the couplets Isadora had sent them while he was teetering back and forth. That's a strange way to put it. Why didn't she write, inside these letters, I hope you'll see, or inside these letters, you just might see? Sunny show! Sunny cried from the top of her two wobbling siblings. Sunny was waving back and forth like a flower in the breeze. She tried to hang on to Foul Fountain, but the water but the water rushing out of the crow's beak made the metal too slippery. Violet tried tried as hard as she could to steady herself, but the sight of the two figures wearing crow-shaped hats coming around a nearby corner did not help her find her balance. Klaus, she said, I don't mean to rush you, but please rethink as quickly as you can. The citizens are approaching, and I'm not sure how much longer I can hang on. Inside these letters, the eye will see, Klaus muttered again, closing his eyes so he wouldn't have to see the world wobbling around him. Chuck! Sonny shrieked, but no one heard her over Violet's scream as her legs gave out, a phrase which here means that, that she toppled to the ground, skinning her knee and dropping Klaus in the process. Klaus's glasses dropped off, and he fell to the ground of the courtyard elbows first, which is painful way to fall, and as he rolled on the ground, both of his elbows received nasty scrapes, but Klaus was far more concerned about his hands, which were no longer clasping the feet of his baby sister, Sonny. He called, squinting without his glasses, Sonny, where are you? Honey, Sonny screamed, but it was even more difficult than usual to understand what she meant. The youngest bottler had managed to climb to the beak of the crow with her teeth. But as the fountain kept spitting out water from, from her mouth, it began to slip off the slick metal surface. Honey, she screamed again as one of her upper teeth started to slip. Sunny began to slide down, down, scrambling desperately to find something to hang on to. But the only feature carved into the head was the staring eye of the crow, which was flat and provided no sort of tooth hold. She slipped down further, farther, farther, and Sunny closed her eyes rather than watch herself fail. Not fail, because there's no eye in there. Fall. Honey, she screamed one last time, gnashing her teeth against the eye in frustration. And as she bit the eye, it, dep it depressed, depressed, and this is a word 
that often describes someone who is feeling sad and gloomy, but in this case, it describes a secret button. Hmm. Hidden in a crow statue that is feeling just fine. Thank you. Oh, let me see here. With a great creaking. Wait, is that the end of the chapter? Let's do that again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It describes a secret button hidden in a crow statue that is feeling just fine. Thank you. With a great creaking. No, can't be the end. Oh, okay. Noise, the button depressed, and the beak of the foul fountain opened as, as wide as it could, each part of the beak flipping slowly down and bringing Sonny down with it. Klaus found his glasses and put them on just in time to see his little sister drop safely into Violet's outstretched arms. The three bottlers looked at one another with relief, and they looked at the widening beak of the crow. Through the rushing water, the three siblings could see two pairs of hands appear, appear on the beak as two people climbed out of Foul Fountain. Each person was wearing a thick wool sweater, so dark and heavy with water, that they both looked like huge, misshapen monsters. The two dripping figures climbed carefully out of the crow and lowered themselves to the ground, and the bottlers ran to clasp the, them in their arms. I do not have to tell you. How overjoyed the children were to see Duncan and Isadora Quagmire shivering in the courtyard. And I do not have to tell you how grateful the Quagmires were to be out of the confines of Foul Fountain. I do not have to tell you how happy and relieved the five youngsters were to be reunited after all this time. And I do not have to tell you all the joyous things the triplets said as they struggled to take off their heavy sweaters and wring them out. But there are things I do have to tell you, and one of those things is the distant figure of Detective Dupin holding a torch and heading straight towards the Baudelaire orphans. Oh my, okay. That is the end of chapter 11. We'll continue with chapter 12 and maybe some more tidbits uh, straight from the writing of Mr. Lemony Snicket. All right, we'll be back soon. I'll be back soon. So sweet. I don't know. <laughs>